welcome everyone to the June 20th City Council work session. We're going to be talking about the uh, budget today. And turn this over to City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. And before we get oh, started, sorry, I, I, said, I promised Alan to do something okay. first. I apologize. Yeah, Thank I have you, a, a point of information. I have two resolutions here that submitting to the council for consideration um, and to have them put on the the uh, calendar for discussion and action by the council um, and the first one is um, in way, is in it um, resolution to oppose the transport of coal for export through Eugene and it talks about that issue and, and uh, calls on the support of the governor's position of doing a programmatic EIS about how all this affects us and the second one is uh, about using the Clean Air Act to uh, <coughs> regulate and reduce greenhouse gas pollution. Um, so uh, I sent these to you to everybody electronically as well, but I wanted to give you these. Um, the second one is actually a part of a national campaign by the Center for Biological Diversity, and there's been 26 cities, and there's a list of them on there, including Chicago and Seattle and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and a whole bunch of cities that have already adopted. Uh, similar or resolutions to this one for uh, the Clean Air Act. So uh, that's part of a, a, a more of a national campaign. So I'll put those out for everybody's consideration. We're going to move back to council. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. No, that hey, manager, thank you for waiting. Your turn this one's for you. Yeah, just if, um, but I would suggest if you want these brought back before summer break, I would suggest during your regular council meeting, either on July 9th, during your, at the end of your 7.30 meeting, either on July 9th or July 23rd. And so I think that's what I would suggest. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And before we get started, I'll ask Sue to introduce some of our new budget committee members as well as new staff. So um, we're lucky we have some of our newly appointed budget uh, committee members that haven't yet started, oh. and one uh, who's only got uh, a few more days left. <laughs> so John Borofsky, you all know from uh, many years of serving on the Budget Committee with us. We also have Bob Clark, um, new newly appointed Budget Committee member, Marty Wilby, um, newly appointed Budget Committee member, and Chelsea Clinton, who has come through mm -hmm. um, Budget season with us already. Uh, oh, and Doug, 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 I didn't see you, Doug. Doug Smith. So we've got several budget committee members here with a high degree of interest in what we're doing. Next. I also just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to a new analyst that we have, which we're very excited about. We've been trying to hire an analyst for a while to help us out, Vicki Silvers, um, who's sitting over there with Mia. Um, and so she joined us just uh, two days ago. So we're throwing her right in. <laughs> Well, uh, just to set the stage briefly on uh, for today, uh, it's a little bit uh, unusual that we're still in FY12. We just approved the FY13 budget, and, and actually we're now going to start conversation on the FY14 budget. And uh, the important part of that is, as you know, over the last four years, there's just been a lot of work by the budget committee and you and the staff and sort of getting us to the place we are, and there's still some uh, challenging work ahead. The other thing that uh, we've talked about and what you have said is that you also want to have a conversation around a sustainable budget, particularly the concept of revenues. And so this is a continuation of that conversation. Today we're not asking for any decisions. We would like uh, input and guidance that you have as we continue through this conversation over the next many months. And we'll have a, a timeline towards the end of our presentation. Uh, for today. And so just to kind of give you a sense of our agenda, <clears throat> yes, Mayor, we'll uh, have a, sh a presentation of a few minutes. Sue will do most of it. So we'll, we're we're going to talk a little bit about a stable and a sustainable budget. We've been talking about that over the last couple of years. A stable budget really is, is one in which we are uh, able to maintain the services that we have as much as possible. We've uh, balanced that against uh, maintaining, minimizing impact on employees and also keeping a responsible reserve, which we have been doing. But then we also want to have a sustainable budget conversation. Uh, as you know, as we've been going through with uh, ongoing needs in parks and recreation facilities, public safety, human services, all of those kinds of things that we want to have that start that conversation. And then we'll uh, continue to 
talk about uh, some discussions that have occurred around new revenues over the last couple of years, and then I'd like to talk just briefly about our approach to the FY14 budgeting process. And so that's our agenda for today, and anything else you want to add to that? Do you want people to you want clarification as you move along? How do you want um, Yeah. This won't take that long. Uh, you know, the, the presentation is going to probably be 10 minutes. Something like that. And then it'll be easy to come back and clarify any of the information that's presented at that time and have a discussion on it. So, Okay, so starting off with a stable versus a sustainable budget. So when you think about the current services that we have, um, you could view them as kind of a set of, you know, library, parks, police, fire, and so forth. And this circle represents those services and the funding levels that we have currently. Um, we, if we had a stable budget, we would have enough revenues to pay for all those things, but we don't, right? So this is not to scale, but basically we only have enough to pay for some of the services that we're currently providing, and that um, uh, you know from our FY13-14 um, two-year uh, plan to balance the budget, we're about $7 million short, about $4 million of which we've um, tackled in the FY13 budget process, and we've still got about another $3 million to go for in the FY14 process. So in addition to the current mix of services, there are also other things that we would like to be able to accomplish, some of them related to our current services. So for instance, we have roads that we can't maintain. We have buildings that we're not maintaining sufficiently. We also have done a lot of planning. You know, We have a parks and open space master plan. We have a pedestrian and bike master plan. We have all kinds of master plans that have um, lots of uh, things that the community would like to see happen. Those, those things are not yet funded. Um, and we also don't live on an island. There are other governments that have a current service level um, that also um, have funding issues um, where, uh, you know, Lane County, for instance, is going to be having to make quite a lot of budget reductions in the near future, and that affects some of our services and our citizens, too. So just a general high-level concept of um, stable, which would be the stuff we have now, and sustainable, which would be those things that we aren't funding adequately or that we would like to fund that we aren't currently funding. So this is our FY13-14 stable budget plan that you saw um, last spring when we started talking about the FY13 budget. Uh, if we did nothing, um, what this shows is our reserve for revenue shortfall would just get e eaten up by the little <laughs> little Pac-Man, um, and our reserve would pretty much be gone um, in the next two years. Um, so we embarked upon a two-year stable budget plan. The FY13 budget includes about $14 million worth of reductions, and you can see that helps move our revenue revenue shortfall. What did I say? 14. I said four. Sorry, four. <laughs> 13, 14, 4, 3. Yeah. Um, that moves our reserve for revenue shortfall line up, but we still run out by the end of our forecast period if we don't do something. So our two-year strategy would include additional reductions in FY14 to make sure that we can pay for the services that we have and also maintain a reserve. So here's just another way of um, talking about the things that are important to think about when we talk about a sustainable budget. <coughs> um, we want to have ongoing revenues that equal or exceed the ongoing expenses over the long term. We want to uh, be able to afford the full cost for the services and the facilities that we have and that we would like to have. Um, so we would like to have enough money to pay for um, building maintenance and uh, parks maintenance and so forth. Um, we would like to maintain an 8% reserve over the long term. And our service mix is balanced with the community's goals and their willingness and ability to pay for those services. I think um, it's important to us to remember that a sustainable budget is not everything everybody wants at any cost. It's really trying to balance those things, as John mentioned, the, the three legs of the stool. So we have been on this path to try and achieve a sustainable budget for several years now, but with the length and the depth of the recession, um, I would say it's more like a marathon than a sprint. Um, we keep um, moving the finish line. So in FY10 and FY11, we made about $18 million worth of budget reductions. And part of our um, conversation was to, at that point, to create, John created the Meeting the Challenge Task Force to talk potentially about new revenues. FY12, we made another $2 million of reductions. And 
Um, the Budget Committee recommended that the Council Subcommittee on Human Service Funding be created. We had those conversations. And then FY13 and 14, our stable budget plan um, is looking for another $7 million over those two years. Um, I should say that throughout this period, we've really tried to explore lots of different ways to provide services, reduce costs, and so on. And um, one of the things that has also been important during this time is that um, we, we did not include any significant new revenues as we've balanced the budget. We've really done it by trying to reduce costs and reduce services rather than um, increasing revenues. But we have, we have talked periodically through this time about, at some point, looking at um, new revenues. So just very briefly, the Meeting the Challenge Task Force was um, created by the city manager and they did their um, work in the fall of 2008 and, um, and 2008, 2009, Nine. I'm getting Nine. my years mixed, Nine. 2009, sorry. Um, and their charge was really to think about if we had a general fund deficit, um, which we did, and we wanted to try and move towards a sustainable budget with some new revenues, what would that look like? Um, they didn't have a specific target or a specific kind of service or anything like that. And what they said was in the best case, if we grow the economy, um, that's the way to generate new revenues. But they recognized we were, you know, um, in a tough period for the economy and that that's a long-term solution that's not likely to help us um, in the next few years as we needed additional revenue. They also said an income tax was the most fair way to raise new revenues for services, but um, that was when measures 66 and 67 were on the ballot and some uncertainty about, about what would happen with those things and they just felt like the timing wasn't right for that as an option. So their recommendation was a 5% restaurant tax, which would generate about $14 million annually. And alternatives were a uh, utility consumption tax or a citywide monthly fee for service, which sometimes is also called a utility fee. Um, so that's where they landed. And then um, last fall, we had the Council Subcommittee on Human Service Funding, um, and their charge was given to them um, as a result of a budget committee suggestion to look for ways to increase the level and um, <coughs> stable and long-term funding for human services in the community. Four counselors were on that committee, um, Councilor Pryor, Ortiz, Brown, and Farr. Um, and they had a number of uh, ideas. Um, their report came up with two main recommendations. Um, one was to, uh, well, the main recommendation was to keep funding existing human service budget to the extent we could, which was about $2 million, recognizing that that, that might not be entirely possible with budget um, pressures, and to look for new funding of about six or $700,000. And that new funding would come from either a utility consumption tax or a monthly public service fee. And they also um, recommended that at some point a regional discussion be undertaken on this topic because it's a regional issue. Um, but they did not try and define what that would look like. It was more of a concept for a phase two. Um, another um, source of information that we have for you is the multi-year financial plan. Um, you know, I mentioned there's a number of other services for which we've talked about identifying um, funding over the years. Um, the multi-year financial plan catalogs those things and came up with um, these nine items as the, the ones that we would like to tackle in the near future. You can see over six years it's about $135 million worth of um, estimated costs when we did this, which was um, back in the fall of 2010. Uh, and then we have time marching on, and other things have happened since the fall of 2010. Um, we've been having a lot of conversations in the community about public safety. Uh, Opportunity Eugene has been um, going on. Uh, there was the human service conversation. And certainly other things will be identified um, over time that we need to think about tackling. And so um, there's really just two basic options for how to balance your budget when it all really comes down to it. You can either reduce your spending 
um, which would make your service mix smaller and you could live within the resources that you have available. Or you could look for uh, additional funding, increase your revenues in order to um, fill the gap and maybe add services. But to the extent that you want to add beyond our current service mix, that makes the gap bigger. So that's something important to keep in mind. And then the 50,000 foot level, um, if you want to move forward with thinking about new revenues, um, John's going to talk in more detail about this, but really the idea that we're going to bring forward is that you have some conversations about new revenues. Um, we use those conversations to help us with building the FY14 budget and then potentially um, ask the voters uh, what they would like to do as a result of those conversations. So if you want to go to the next one. Sure. So just how that looks, essentially what we're going to do is uh, a staff has put together two budgets. Uh, the one budget will be based on a um, no new revenues scenario, just as, as we've done the last four years. We'll go through the same principles. Internally, we'll go through the same process. Our basic goals uh, will not change. That's to align our budget beyond, behind uh, the goals and outcomes, uh, things that we've talked about in Eugene Counts to maintain uh, services, minimize impact on employees, and also move towards a stable budget, which includes a responsible reserve of about 8%. So we are going to put that together. The other budget that we will put together is, as you have conversations around a sustainable budget and new revenue sources, what we'd like to be able to do is bring back to the council through that conversation different options of new revenues uh, different packages and if you choose to put something onto the ballot in May or choose to implement something there'd be enough time to have that decided before the adoption of the FY14 budget. So how that looks really is starting this conversation now around <laughs> revenues uh, discussions um, as we uh, get into December what we would do is actually have uh, those a uh, couple of budget scenarios that come before you so you will start getting a sense of what our strategies will be to fill that three million dollar gap and recognize that's just a snapshot so it could be more or less but whatever that gap is based on that forecast at that time we will uh, start talking about what those strategies are at the same time between now and December we will have had several conversations with you about new revenue scenarios in order to make a May ballot, if you choose to do that, you would need to make some decisions in February to put something on the ballot. And then uh, based on those election results, if you choose to do that, if, not, if it doesn't pass, then we know essentially the budget that will be coming forward. If it does pass, we'll have a sense of what that will mean for the budget at that time, and then we'll go through a regular adoption process. It's, uh, part of it will feel compressed on the front end because there'll be a little bit more information up front for us on staff. We'll be doing a lot more information, a lot more through the summer and early fall than we uh, often will do. And then uh, after you make some decisions in February, it'll we'll get a sense of uh, what that budget might look like. And so that's what we're planning on doing um, with the budget process for FY14. So any questions or on the whole? whole topic decide who can yeah mm -hmm. unless, unless we want to refer back to it but we can turn it off yeah to blind them yes <laughs> thank you mayor i appreciate all the work mr manager i uh, i appreciate the the intelligent long-term planning. I wonder, though, I've brought up multiple times now, and it wasn't a part of this discussion. And it's really disappointing to me that what we're not talking about is how to expand our tax base. We're not talking about a strategic plan for increasing the amount of property because, <clears throat> as everybody knows, our system is predominantly funded by property taxes. So what we're not doing is having a strategic conversation about how to increase the amount of taxable property, which we could do and we're certainly talking about with regard to Envision Eugene. And we're not linking and connecting the two, which I think is a, is a, is a really uh, an unfortunate mistake. 
I don't believe we will have the we will have success at passing any new kind of tax before the voters. And I think the, the responsible thing for us to do is to begin talking about how we grow our tax base in order to meet our obligations or to begin a, a serious discussion about serious service cuts. So I'm I'm a little disappointed that that wasn't a part of the discussion yet. Well, I, in response, um, the the JEO Prosperity Report, in which this council was a part of in approving and adopting a couple of years ago, we are, with all of our partners, aggressively trying to move forward on that, and all of that has to do with expanding the economic base. And so uh, all of that is going on and probably what we can do is come back and talk more about that but that is a very active process for us on <coughs> staff to do exactly that is to create additional economic uh, development so we can come back and I, I think it would uh, be a, a helpful thing to be, have okay. that as an absolute part of this discussion because it's integral to whether or not we succeed uh, right I, and I think part of what we are trying to do is expand that base and we can come back and definitely have a okay. conversation about that. Thank you. Andrea? Well, thank you for the presentation and welcome to the new budget members. And thank you, John Borowski, for your years of commitment to this community. I, I, you were just an awesome budget member and we're going to really feel your loss this in the next coming cycles. Um, so John, I'm just kind of curious. Um, we've a, you've, this is a good presentation talking about all the work that's been done that's going to be going into the possible ballot measure but is there a targeted plan specifically of which where the funds will go I mean so when you know are we talking about um, human services work that we did or are we talking about the work that the challenge group did I mean which work plan are you are you basing this <coughs> on? that's gonna be part of the conversation over the next couple of months that we will um, be asking the council to narrow that down on where you think one if the if the community is willing to add additional monies, where would they be willing to invest that in? And so we will continue to have all this information and based on the conversations, continually try to narrow it down based on your conversations as we go. So we don't have a predisposed idea. Okay. And, and so then my next question is, will this also, so there's also the road subcommittee and are they thinking mm -hmm. about going on the May ballot also? I mean, are we talking about putting two or three measures out there or are we just going to narrow it to one or? The um, what will be coming to you uh, in a July. couple of weeks, in July, is uh, a renewal right. of the current bond, mm -hmm. road bond, and um, based on previous conversations, we're bringing that back for action in July to put that onto the November ballot. Okay, okay. And so, so uh, our anticipation is, if the council chooses that in November, we'll move forward on that. There also, if you choose a, a different revenue source for other services that would that could occur in May. Thank you. So before I, I leave my minutes, I want to thank Kurt for fixing Seneca. I've driven by there, and it's <laughs> one level, too. one level. So and I, and I haven't gotten any more phone calls. So I really appreciate. It. I know that that's not a road, <coughs> but gravel goes a long way. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, Debbie. Thank you. You saw my hand before I even put it up. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it was on the way up. Um, first, a response to Mike's expanding the base. Uh, I think we, if we keep giving tax exemptions to every new thing that happens, it certainly won't expand our base. Um, also, if we expand it through expanding the area of the city, then we need more services. The more people you have, the more services you need, more police, more teachers, which we don't <coughs> do directly, but we are certainly affected uh, more of all the services. Um, and response to Andrea is about saying what it's for. I think for the roads, it's good that we're having a, a measure just for roads because that's everybody knows about that and everybody's mm -hmm. so interested and so affected. But Aside from that, I don't think the earmarks are good. I think it's good that the federal government's got getting rid of earmarks and that we probably should not have earmarks, that we should we do need more money, but then we should decide what services are needed and what we should do with it. Um, I'd like more information about the um, payroll tax. I know that the committee so rejected it, but um, I think it has possibilities, and it is one way to do what some people have been asking for is 
uh, tax some of the people who use our services but don't or aren't, aren't taxed as city residents. If they're working, <coughs> they would be taxed, perhaps. So I, I would like uh, us to really consider that and like more information about how it would be done. Uh, <coughs> I think we should reconsider the personal income tax. I know that it failed when the county tried it, but they tried it on, it, they didn't start at a high enough income. People have suggested starting above a $100,000 income. When you put it all the way down to people who are barely living, spending every cent they have just to get by, they're not likely to vote for another tax if they have the option to vote. I, I would like more consideration of personal income tax of incomes over 100,000. And all of you who are making hundreds of thousands will, will not want that, I know. Um, do you? <laughs> um, business license tax. I, I, I know that we keep getting told that it wouldn't work here, but it seems to help in Portland. I would like to know how they do it. I, and I know that it's a 2.2%. And if we did that, could we collect it the same way they do? And uh, I think we could learn something from Portland. They don't seem to have <coughs> quite as many problems as we do financially. Last I heard, and I, my time's up. Thank you. Hmm. So before we go to round two, I just want to ask if uh, George or Chris or Alan have anything uh, that they want to ask about or discuss. <coughs> Just, I, I appreciate the work. This is a very difficult issue because we're actually trying to find a balance between looking responsible in terms of the services we cut but also being responsible in terms of what we might want to add. And the public is always judging us constantly on, on what that is. We have done a lot of work. I served with Alan on the Committee on Transportation and, that, and even though it's a number of years ago, it is still a significant conversation. It's still a significant issue. Currently on human services, that is also a significant issue. Part of what we need to do is determine how aware the public is of how important these issues are because they're going to be the ultimate deciders of, of what the option is we're going to go for. And we have to be able to demonstrate that the money we're spending right now is the most responsible, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> is being spent in the most responsible way possible. And I think we've done a lot to um, Im increase the confidence that we are doing exactly that. And I think it's been a, uh, I think the staff has done a very important job, but I think we also have tried to demonstrate that as well. That all goes into the discussion of whatever options we want to look at have got to be very mindful of the, the community's willingness to accept that. Um, and so, as I showed in the human services presentation, we have to try to avoid being unilateral in what we do. Um, you, you wind up suffering for it later on. Um, we also have to consider what are the consequences of whatever decision we make. I can remember years ago going to a presentation where they talked about the, the cost benefit of different kinds of property in the property tax base. And for every dollar that you receive in revenue from, from industrial property, it costs you like 19 cents to actually service it. Um, uh, commercial um, and uh, uh, government, uh, public property, for every dollar you received, uh, it would cost like 37 cents to service it. What's interesting is regular residential property, for every dollar you got in property tax, cost a dollar 19 to service. So in other words, if you create an entire community of single family residents or an entire community of just <coughs> residents, you're going to wind up losing money. So you have to create a balance. And I guess that's the point is you've got to find a balance between those areas that have a net gain to your overall economy so that you can provide the money to support those things that don't. That's what we need to figure out: is what is the what is the balance between commercial, industrial, residential, um, what the public's willing to support, how we're spending money. I, this is so many moving parts; it's mind-boggling. And I think we need to try to avoid <coughs> trying to distill this down to well, you just do a couple of things and everything will be fine. Because um, I don't think it'll be that simple. If it was, we would have solved it a long time ago. Mm. I agree with what some of what Chris was saying, and I think as a whole, the city has done a good job in the last few years of, of being fiscally responsible and trying to uh, approach the, the gaps in, in a sensible way. Um, I'm not real wild about the idea of going out for new taxes. 
I'd have to see what it is before I, you know, come up with a yes or no to, to, to send it out to the ballot. But if we do do that, <clears throat> it's very important that any any monies that we ask for are, are earmarked to where they're going to go. And I think they need to go to the basic services first. Uh, if we just go out and, and, and to the city, the, the city voters and say, we need $14 million a year, trust us, we're not going to get very far with that one. If we go out saying we need $14 million a year and it's going to go X here, Y here, is, you know, very specific on where that money is going to go, I think we will get a better response. I'm not so sure it would pass anyway, but at least I think we'd get a better response because we have, we have proven to the people that when we say we're going to spend money in a certain way, we do, such as what we've done with the, the road repairs. And I, I think what, if, if we do go out for a vote, I think it needs to be set up that, that way also. Uh, and one last thing, uh, I'd like to recognize another budget committee member that came in after the start of the meeting is uh, Mark Russ sitting back there in the corner very quietly. Welcome. So just for a second, to build on what George is saying, that I think one of the things that we've seen in the road discussion is people, I feel like they've got an investment to protect in our roads, and when they erode and become unusable, they feel like they're losing some of that investment. So there are a number of services that we provide as a community that if we don't protect our investment, we're actually losing what we already have and what the community has in invested in. And so there is a way of uh, looking at this and talking with the community about protecting the investments that they have in things that they uh, they feel like they've already um, put a lot of themselves into and that's a that's sort of a, a, a basic level in a way I think of talking to people about the, protecting that investment that they've already made in whether it's your parks or your roads or other basic um, infrastructure and services in our community it's a whole nother discussion I suppose you can talk in some ways about some of the other needs of human services <coughs> as in investment in the as sort of the infrastructure of families and, and that kind of thing and how how far do we think we need to do that to preserve that for for our community but it's it's uh, I think it's got to be um, and I'd like to have that discussion with the public but I I think it's it's more about um, the, the the practicality of, of how we um, Continue to have a good community by uh, by taking care of the basic things in our in our community, as opposed to something that might seem to them like we're doing a feel good thing, but it, they can't relate it to uh, the livability of the community, or they can't relate it to um, why it really makes a difference in everybody's lives and is part of the investment in our community. So I think we really have to think about how we frame the discussion of what's most important and <coughs> protect and what we need to build on in that, that in that kind of conversation. Alan. Yeah, I'm glad we're having this conversation uh, and discussion. Um, it's the kind of conversation I asked for during the road bond um, meeting we had the other day because we need to have that co larger context uh, about how this all fits together mm -hmm. and, and uh, beyond just the road repair uh, issue and the backlog that was well over a hundred million dollars and we which we still haven't solved so but we have all these other things I think the most important two um, slides in your presentation were the two honeycomb slides because what they represent to me are all these different needs that, that we have what's unclear and where I think we need to go with this is that they need to be prioritized they need to be quantified and and we need to discuss the community acceptance of these of these things and whether or not people would be willing to pay for them so um, and I I absolutely agree that we need specific needs or services tied to a specific fee or revenue source uh, whether that be roads or jail beds or or, or human services or parks or ambulance um, transport fee um, and, and have that conversation, kind of go through this, prioritize them, figure out how much they cost, and see which ones make the most sense, and, and have a conversation of whether or not community wants to invest in these things to make our community a better place to live. If they do, um, they'll vote for it. If they don't, so we need to, then they won't. And so we need to make a compelling case for uh, why we would 
choose the ones that we chose and 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 then finally I think the administrative cost of of any of these kind of revenue things is, is really important it needs to be pretty straightforward it needs to be uh, fairly uh, easy to do and and uh, uh, and uncomplicated and I think that's that along with the specific nature of the road bond is why it why it passed so overwhelmingly um, so I'm I'm anxious to get on with a conversation about the priorities here uh, and we can and and we can do that without the assumption of we're absolutely going to do this so everybody can participate <laughs> and and then quantify them and figure out which ones we, we would go out first and what would be the revenue source for them and then and then vote whether or not we want to actually do that next round I've got Andrea and then Betty so um, thank you mayor so just to make sure that I'm understanding the conversation um, in our packet on um, page 31 there's a memorandum from Larry Hill and it gives all the previous identified general fund revenue alternatives and so are we are we talking are you suggesting that we go out to the voters versus something we can do with council action or can we kind of mesh mesh them at one point you had come to, we had talked about a restaurant um, tax and I just was thinking about what's happening in our community this week and how much money that's bringing into our local restaurants and thinking, gee, wouldn't that be nice of all these outsiders who are taking advantage of our beautiful community were giving up something beside, you know, to us as a city. So what was your thoughts about that, Gandhi? Do you have any You know, thoughts? right now we're not recommending anything either to go out or not go out with any sort of new revenue and whether it uh, has to go out to the voters or something the council can approve that. Uh, our intent is over the next several months is to have that conversation here and then as part of bringing back those two <coughs> budgets, mm -hmm. one of them would be based on everything we've heard, here would be our recommendation uh, to go out for some sort of revenue measure. Mm -hmm. and. And then you can choose if that's the right one or if you want to go out or not go out at that time so we're not we're not predisposed to anything at the moment so my next question is um, we there was a great article in the paper on Sunday about perhaps a fire merger perhaps a taxing district is this going to be a part of that conversation I think all of that could be part of this conversation um, in this in the context of a sustainable budget because we've talked about ambulance transport fund we've talked about the merging of the fire department there has been conversations uh -huh. about the district uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so all that can be part of this conversation for the next okay, so are months. you just looking for direction to to begin that conversation is this just we, we're going to be doing it regardless of we're going to be doing that okay. conversation okay. this is just the first step in that okay. to, to introduce mm -hmm. you to what uh, our intent is as we go if, mm -hmm. if you don't like how we're going to have that conversation it would be nice to know that now so then we can change the process mm -hmm. this is really about here's what the process is mm -hmm. if you have some thoughts on the process or about the whole topic of sustainable budgets uh, just good to get those thoughts okay. and inputs now thank so. you thank you um, I agree John it's good to I'm glad you said we'll have the conversation here first but I, I hope that in the meantime we will try to involve all the neighborhood organizations and and give all this information to them about possible sources of revenue and I'm glad we're finally talking about revenue we've been putting it off for a long time but I think there's a big difference between temporary and ongoing sources of revenue temper the road fund is temporary and it's for a specific thing it's an emergency really as Kurt knows and if <laughs> as he's been telling us and everyone uses them and everyone sees them so it's a different kind of thing from the kinds of expenses that are going on year after year and we know that we don't have enough revenue for those expenses also um, a problem with designating what everything is going to be for is we don't know what needs we're going to have we didn't know that we were going to be considering a opportunity I uh, forget the rest of the name that uh, opportunity village I mean I was trying to get the name of the group but anyway that we were going to be considering that village and there may be other things that come up that are really important and there may be things that we find we are doing that we don't need to do anymore too but I think that <coughs> if we start saying all of our revenue is earmarked that's that is not a good thing we don't know ahead of time and we have to trust that this council and future councils will 
uh, with the input of the public think carefully about how they spend the revenue. But I think if we go out asking for a general uh, for money for no specific purpose, we can certainly say we need it for this and this and this and this is the amount of this is what we're spending now and this is our income and and just like you're doing now, tell let the public know what's going on. But I don't think we need to. I I just think to repeat myself. I think there's a big difference between a temporary levy and an ongoing for forever or almost forever. Thank you, Chris. To kind of continue on that thinking, um, ongoing versus one time or or short term. I mean, it's it's really clear whenever you go for short-term funding you can do that for a defined set of projects I know that um, other cities have done utility taxes around a defined set of road and street improvement process projects and have encountered actually not that much resistance because it was a defined list for for a set period of time and that's definitely an option to look at if we wanted to get at some sort of a utility or, or, or a structural fee because it, it's been done in other cities but it is a short-term defined list and I think that's actually what generates the support the challenge with long term or ongoing is because of the very reason you don't always know what it's going to be for you're moved into the position of asking people for money and you can't tell them how you're going to spend it that's why general purpose taxes were created in the first place and it's the ultimate form of trust me and the challenge with trust me funding is you have to trust the person that you're giving the money to and the, the more you make that a long-term undefined funding source, in other words, I'm giving you a check and you get to fill it out every week, um, but I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to spend it on, or I'm going to give you a general list of what I'm going to spend it on, not everybody is comfortable with that unless they have a very high level of confidence that you're a very responsible person with their money. And there are, there are people who certainly do that. So I think short-term one-time funding options is actually a, a fairly easy conversation I think we can have that conversation it can be pretty straightforward to me a conversation about what do we do to create sustainable long-term funding whether it's through new sources or through sustainable cuts is an extraordinarily difficult conversation because you can't go five feet into that conversation without running into the trust me element of that conversation with your community. We could impose anything we want to, but if it's imposed as a long-term funding strategy on a trust me basis, I think there, it, you'll get it referred back. It won't pass. It, it, whatever the consequence of that is going to take place. So um, I'm really challenged by how we can have that conversation about long-term sustainable funding. I think it may take us to really explore what, it, what are our policy issues around that, because that's, for me, where a lot of people look at whether or not they're going to have faith in you is what are your policies? What do you operate under? What are the what are the rules that you that you work by? Um, if I can believe in those, then I can be a little bit more lenient with you. But short of that, I think it's a real challenge for us. I'm I'm absolutely interested in having the conversation. We have to have the conversation, but we've got to go into it with our eyes open in terms of what what's at stake. What really are the issues? Not the projects. It's the why. I guess I just add to that, and I know you've talked about it somewhat, but uh, obviously we're not having this conversation in a vacuum. There are all these other um, government entities are having a similar uh, kind of conversation, and some of them are even bigger than our conversations, and some of them are even, um, you know, I'm watching, and I, I admit to uh, some discomfort with some of the um, discussion with um, eWeb right now because it feels like because of their financial situation they're moving down the road really fast and the, and the community hasn't caught up with the conversation and, and so I guess I my the, the cautionary point to me is to have a, um, a real conversation with the community about where we are I know every time we have a conversation with the community it takes a a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of staff, everything. But there's, if we're truly heading down to trying to make some really big decisions, then it seems like from the very get-go, we have to have a conversation with the public about why we have to have this discussion and what it is we're trying to figure out and that they're part of figuring that out with us. And if we get very far down the road at all in everything you've outlined here and we and the public doesn't really get why we're having it we'll have to go back and 
and clean it up. So I just feel very, having watched everybody struggling with this in various places around the community, I, I feel really um, uh, how important it is that we have a really straightforward conversation with the community from the get-go about what it is we're trying to address and why and do they want to and how much and mm -hmm. and then that sort of guides us as we move through the through the conversation so in a way it's not figuring out what we can get away with doing it's more like uh, this we're all in this together we're facing this and providing these services for all of us and we have this puzzle to figure out here. You're part of that. It's your dollars that we're paying for it. So we really need to have a conversation about what we think is doable given the, um, the context that, that we're living in right now. So, uh, not an easy thing, but I think it's really important. Yeah, I, I, I was going to comment that one of the things missing from this context here is what are our other governmental partners doing because that plays into it as well, especially in timing and, 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 and how. <laughs> and one of the things about this that uh, the conversation that we have to have is that we have been doing things differently and we have been reducing services for numbers of years. I mean, we've just gone through, uh, just to remind everybody, $20 million worth of reductions over the last couple of years and, and now going into another $7 million on top of that. Um, and we've done a lot of the do things differently, become more efficient, and, and I think there's, there's more to do there, but that's going to be on the margin. You're not going to see big savings there. We're really into reducing services, and that's what we've been doing for the last this last year. And, 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 and as we move forward, unless there's more revenue for investments into services people want, we're going to be reducing services. Uh, and and, and uh, I know the economy's tough, uh, and, and the projections don't look good for our, our revenue so, um, sources. So uh, as that starts to turn around, and, and I think it has started to turn around, but it's not there for everybody, um, it's a good time to start this conversation because it's, it is a conversation that we have to have with the community and it does take a lot of time as the mayor said but um, I agree it needs to be on an ongoing revenue source but it needs to be very specific and very constrained I think the reason the road bond won was because we were very specific and we were very constrained and and um, and it's a political loser, I think, to throw out something that's general or on a promise. Uh, and, and so I think we, have, we need to figure out which of these things are the most important to us, see if we can come to agreement or consensus, and, um, and then tell, have a conversation with the community about what, and try to tell them why this investment is good and why, it, why you should vote for it to pay for it because it does X, Y, and Z, and you benefit from it by X, Y, and Z. I think that's why the road bond won, because we were very specific and people saw the benefit, and so they, this direct linkage. Anything that's not in that realm, I think, is a, a political non-starter. It's also the conversation about uh, what we have already lost or are in the process of losing, and there's a whole piece here from my perspective about how you talk about um, human services and I come from a very strong human services background but I feel like we sometimes uh, at our own peril are looking to the next bar we want to get to but we may be losing some of the very valuable things we're already offering so for it's speaking to the choir here but obviously to me um, families do better our kids do better everybody does better if we have cultural activities they can um, attend. Uh, everybody does better when our parks are open and, and there's places for people to go do things. So, and those are within our purview now and we're, we're cutting back on, on those basic services and they really are a human service element that, that keeps, gives people good things to do and really helps families deal with, uh, with the time. So I, I think as we look to what we might want to add, we really have to look at what we already do that uh, meet some of those needs and be sure that we we don't uh, forget that, that those are, um, we're losing ground on those. And that should be really part of this conversation as well. 
Eddie? Yes, what, what you said is really true, and I think <clears throat> there are many things that we don't all use, but they're important for the community. I, I know when my children were young, I used the par public parks a lot. And later, after we had a big backyard, we didn't use them as much, but that didn't mean it wasn't important for us to help pay for the parks for everybody. And there are many things like that that people don't see that they need in the same way that they see they need the roads. But but we, as schools, of course, we don't deal with directly, but the schools are something that we all need, whether we even ever had children or not. And so I think that when you talk about letting people know exactly what you're going to do, do we do that with the money we currently have? Are we going to say we spend so much of it on this and this and this? And do you, do you like that or not? I, I think it's, it gets to be impossible. I just thought of another tax that we can't do, but the real estate transfer tax, which the legislature passed a law banning, but I think it should be on our list of legislative uh, policies that we want changed. If we could have a real estate transfer tax, that is something that a lot of people think is easy and fair, and it's not something you pay every year. Thanks. I just wanted to mention that we had another new budget committee member join us. Um, Jill featherstone um is also here, so we got a good showing from our citizens on this topic. Did we have a meeting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you know what they're in for? Though? Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts or comments? How about from our execs, what do you think? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> We should also mention, I think, uh, Kim, is this your last council meeting? Yeah, so just to kind of... Thank you. Thank you. Done a great job for us, obviously. And the other thing that comes to my mind is, uh, getting back to the theme, though, uh, that um, we are in, always in conversations with Hopefully. our partners and uh, uh, school districts we meet with on a regular basis. We have monthly meetings with the superintendents and so forth. And as the, for instance, 4J right now is doing, as you probably all are acutely aware, are doing a lot of sort of uh, rethinking what they're going to be in and re-evolving uh, 4J. And in that discussion, uh, come up a lot of sort of partnership ideas. And so as we look out at how we're going to uh, provide services or how we're going to accomplish something, thinking how we can do better do that with our, um, our partners should be part of that conversation. And that's an opening where you're not um, having your usual discussion sort of over who's, who puts a measure out when or what, you know, those kind of discussions. It, it, that's, a, that's a more sort of productive discussion of you got a problem, we got a problem, and what can we do together with our using our resources more efficiently to provide what you need to provide, what we need to provide. And so that, that could be, um, should and could be part of this discussion as well. Chris? Just a, a, a last thought. I, part of the... Um, the confidence, I won't just call it trust me, part of the confidence that you have is that you understand very clearly where the community is or where, the, where your government is, where your leaders are in terms of what they, what they want and what they don't want, what they support and what they don't. And I'm back to something Alan mentioned, looking at these two um, mm -hmm. uh, honeycomb. honeycomb charts. If I look at this chart, I don't necessarily know what the priorities are here. Mm -hmm. They're all here, they're all just listed, but we have not even to ourselves or to the community clearly articulated what are the priorities here. And that, that's not something for staff to do. Staff can help us do that, but that's something we have to do. And I know this city has been wrestling with prioritizing needs for decades because it's very hard to step up to that and then make yourself do it. We don't want to do it, and so we figured out ways to avoid doing it. But I think at least in terms of this page, we have got to do that to provide clarity not only to ourselves but to our community. If we're going to ask them for money, they've got to know what our, what our priorities are and what, what, we, what we have ranked being the, the essential, the things that we need, and then those things that are, that are important, they're valuable. It's not a value judgment. It's an order discussion, and I think we need to establish what that order is going to be. Um, and, I, and I think we need to do that sooner rather than later so that we can send that clarity to our community um, before we have any conversations about, about money. Alan? 
I follow on that. I, I think if if staff were to take each one of these honeycomb boxes, whatever they are, honeycomb <coughs> sectors, and um, define what they are uh, for discussion purposes, and so we can start having a conversation about that, and then quantify the dollar amount that would take on an ongoing basis, and then we can have this conversation about the prioritization of them and, and set up a work session where we would then look at all of these and and then and then following that we could talk about how to fund them and then uh, as well as what our other governmental partners are doing and what time it would be and then finally when we've got all that in place then we can decide whether or not we want to do it but I don't, I don't think we have enough info to go to that last step I think there's a lot of stuff in between that would uh, be helpful for me to walk my way through that yeah I will mayor thanks um, uh, Chris touched on something I've uh, a drum that I think I've, I've beat uh, mercilessly for years about the idea that the city should do more in the way of entire service priority setting um, I remember a, a colleague once saying we can't prioritize our way out of budget problems I I would to this day still uh, suggest that we absolutely must and having a, a broader conversation about service priorities is the very first and most intelligent place to start when coming to a time like we're in <coughs> where finances are tight I think it helps the process and it helps provide confidence when or if we ever went out to the public with a question it's for them to have a very clear picture of our priorities and where we're spending and why we're spending the money that we have so I would like to add my voice to that chiming in saying once again that I think a, a clear discussion about priority setting is in order. I, I wanted to respond to what Alan said. And um, you may recall that we do this multi year financial plan, and that is um, where we, um, staff, takes a look throughout the organization for all of the um, things that we, the significant issues that we have that are unfunded. Um, the last time we did this was uh, the fall of 2010, and um, you saw it in early 2011. We present it to the Budget Committee, um, and we do it once every two years. So we are um, just getting ready to embark upon um, an update of that. Um, one thing that we did different this last time was instead of having a list of more than 100 items, we actually pulled forward nine of them that we considered to be the most pressing ones based on the conversations in the community and so forth and so we've been trying to move in that direction but but as you um, mentioned there's just there's a lot of things that we would like to do and it's hard to prioritize them all but there is there is some information about all of those um, in the multi-year financial plan and we'll be updating that it seems like one of the things that we could do as we move through this is sort of push front and center, at least on our website, how we're hoping to go through this process and sort of a, uh, try to make it in a, um, in a way that's real accessible to the public. And by that I mean they don't have to know the question in order to get the answer that we will um, lay it out for them in a way that doesn't ha they don't have to have the, to know where they're going and we'll mm -hmm. help them find that way. So I don't know if you'd already plan to do that, but I think it's a really, and if that's sort of the um, meat of a lot of the work we're going to be doing, then for it to be sort of pushed up to the front of, of um, what we're putting out to the public seems really good. Okay, well, I guess anything else for you guys? No, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Budget Committee.